And today, we are going to talk about worship. And we're going to do things a little differently than we normally do them. So, the best thing I know to tell you right now is, put on your seatbelt and hang on and let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we talk about giving our best in worship, it demands us to ask the question, God, and everybody in the room right now, I, just, I want you to just block out all the distractions, the stuff you came in here with, <coughs> block out what you're going out of here to, and just be still before him and ask him these questions. God, are you getting my best in worship? Am I giving you everything I have to offer? God, is what I bring to you based more on what I grew up with, my traditions, my rituals, my preference, my comfort level? Or is it based more on what you say in your word that you desire from me and what you want? Did you even tell me in your word, Lord, what you want? And if you did, then open my heart and my mind to hear what you say to me today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. <clears throat> I want to share with you today a piece of information that I'm betting 97, maybe 100% of you have never received before. I had never received this information in this way until I read about it this summer while on sabbatical, read these words and studied these words, they are the seven Hebrew words, the, the seven primary Hebrew words that God gave to his people way back at the beginning of time when he was instituting his covenant with the Israelites. And he said, y'all going to be my people. And these are the seven words I'm giving you for praise and worship. And this is how I want you to approach me. This is how I want you to worship me. This is how I want you to relate to me. This is how I want you to represent me to the rest of the world. This is how I want to be represented. This is how I want to be known. This is how... I want to be approached and worshipped. And God gave them those seven words and said, this is how you do it. Anybody ever told you those seven words? I never got it growing up. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in a traditional church setting. That's what I did. Half my life was spent in a traditional United Methodist church. Nothing wrong with that. Great value. My home church, still love that church, great people there, came to faith while in that church. <laughs> but our worship in that church was void of any expression whatsoever. If anybody brought any kind of expression like, saying amen or raising your hands or shouting or doing some of the stuff we do here. If, if anybody did that at Waxhaw United Methodist Church, it was because they were a visitor that day. But it wasn't because you was one of the peeps. Because the worship there was considered, it was very much, um, and some of you, maybe you grew up with this. It was, you know, um, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy as it was in the beginning. Y'all know that song? You know that one, and you know all the creeds. 
And you never sang above this volume unless you were singing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And on every other song you go back to about here. Right? Some of you grew up, and that was half my life, man. And there was no real physical <clears throat> expression. It's not that we didn't love Jesus. It's just that's the way it was. That was the ritual, and that's what everybody else did. That's what we were taught, and that just, that was normal. And nobody ever said, did you know that way back at the beginning of time, God gave his people seven words for praise and worship and said, this is how I want you to do it. Anybody ever told? I, nobody. And I know people say, well, that's the Old Testament. It is, but it's a foundation. Jesus didn't come away to do away with the old covenant. He came to fulfill it. And when he came, he said in John chapter 4, the true worshipers are going to worship me in spirit and in truth. And basically what that means is you worship me in spirit, that's the right attitude, the right posture. And in truth, that's the right information. So worship in spirit and truth is the right attitude, the right posture with the right information. But in order to have the right posture, something that God is pleased with, you got to have the right information. So today, I'm going to give you the right information. And for most, if not all of you, it's going to be the first time you have ever heard it. And I pray and I hope that you do something with it for your own freedom and for God's glory's sake. Seven primary words <laughs> that God gives us for how he wants to be worshipped. Here's two. First one, Zalmar. This word means to make music, to celebrate in song and music, to touch the strings or parts of a musical instrument. That word right there is used 41 times in this Bible. 41. 41 times God says, I want you to make music to me. I want you to sing. One of those is Psalm 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing Zalmar praises to you. So God says, look, <laughs> the way I want you to approach me and worship me is with music. I want you to use instruments, and I want you to sing. And some of you are sitting there saying, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't sing. God says 41 times, you do. You're wrong. If you don't sing, then you've been approaching him the wrong way your whole life. God says, take music and offer it to me. I'm giving you this. This Music is like a coded DNA in us. I mean, everybody knows music is just like this thing, this gift. Music can speak a language that no other words can speak. How many of you know that? You know that like you, you can be in a mood or something and you can play a song and it just lifts the atmosphere. Music can fire you up. Music can bring you down. Music can make you happy. If you want to be sad, music can make you sad. Music is like a time machine. It can take you to places and events in your history that no other thing can. It can take you back in time. Music has the gift to do what nothing else can do. Take, for example, this right here. Check this out. Some of you will know this. Some of y'all know this one? Just a good old Oh, boy. yeah. Dukes of Hazzard. No Friday night, CBS, 9 p.m. Preceded so by the Incredible Hulk, followed by Dallas. Born. Friday night. Send it home, middle school, spaghetti, garlic bread, incredible Hulk, followed by Dukes of Hazard and Daisy Duke. You've been there, right? Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Cut that one. How about, yeah, music can do that. Just some of you are, are lost in time right now just by hearing that song. Come back. Let me take you another place. Some of you people who were uh, teens in the 80s like me, you maybe you'll know this one. Oh, man, yes, sir. Summer of 1987. Got my shirt off. Colors by Alexander Julian. Benetton. 
Gap, South Park Mall, the food court, all my girlfriends at the pool. Ooh. Oh, wait, cut it off. We, we, we got it. We don't want to get it. But some of you, you know that one, right? Oh, that was big hair. For me, it was hair. <laughs> and lots of it. Blonde, long, pull my bangs down to here, ponytail. Man, I, oh, I can hear that song, and I'm just, I'm back. I'm back, baby. I've left this old bald body, and I'm beautiful again. <laughs> music can do that. Only music. God says, take music. Give it to me. It's a, it, give it to me. It's a gift. It can speak a language like nothing else. Here's another song that, for me, is special. This song right here, I sang three years ago from this stage with my middle son, Ryder. Some of you remember that. But the reason this song matters to me is not so much because of what happened here, but because of what happened just a few short weeks after we sang that song. When we found him in his bed in full-on seizure, and I remember grabbing him and holding him and praying, God, save us. And every time I hear that song, I'll always be transported to that moment. And I will always remember God's faithfulness. Good or bad, he was with me. Only music can do that. That's why God says, I want you to sing. Open your mouth. Sing. Bring me music. It matters that you sing and open your mouth. It really does. 41 times God said it. The second word was yadal. This word means <clears throat> to revere or worship with extended hands. To hold out the hands, I love this one, to throw a stone or arrow. This word is used 111 times in Scripture. One of those is Psalm 67, verse 3. May the peoples praise Yadal, you, God. May all the peoples praise Yadal, you. May the peoples lift up their hands. This one is, get your hands up and praise me. That's what God says. And he says it 111 times. I love the phrase, to throw a stone or arrow, that's like, that's very demonstrative. That's not like, that's when you become so overwhelmed with God's glory and obedience to what he's telling you to do that you go, <sighs> I mean, is there nothing more freeing than when you lift up your hands? Think about like a game or when you win a victory and you're just like, Ugh. Baby. I remember in high school the first time we beat Charlotte Catholic. And I remember going to the visitor's side when the, when the game was over and I went. That was incredible, liberating. I remember the first time I was in worship and I lifted up my hands. I was in my mid-20s. I had been mean, going to a church with a friend of mine. And it was the first time I saw people just be passionate and really excited about Jesus and and, and demonstrate it this way and felt the freedom to do it. And I remember I, I was just so overcome with God's glory. And I just, I was like, <sighs> and for about 45 seconds, I was here and I was scared to death what everybody was thinking. And then in this moment, I just went, <sighs> I was free. I discovered my manhood that day. And I never went. Some of you are still bound up today. What are you waiting on? I know you'll say, I'm not going to do that. Well, 100, you're wrong. 111 times. Today is the day. I know not all of you will. But I'm praying that for the first time you receive this information, today is the day some of you will be set free. You will lift your voice and you will raise your hand. And this is your moment. Are you ready? Some of you, you refuse to do it. You're scared to death. We're going to keep praying that you get free. <laughs> we will. 
But for those of you who are not so comfortable with all the getting up and shouting up, God doesn't leave you out. He also talks about getting down. And the next word, that word is Barak. This one means to kneel, to bless God as an act of adoration, to praise, to salute, to thank. 289 times this one is used. One of which, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. Praise Barak, the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise. Kneel. Get down before the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits. <coughs> this one is all about posture. 289 times this one is used in the Scriptures. And every single time it is used, it is used to describe the worshiper in this position right here flat on their faces before God. Now I ask you the question, when is the last time or the first that you found yourself in this position in worship? Now I know what some of you are saying right now. Mark, if I get in that position, you're going to have to call 911 to get me out of this building. I understand that. Not everybody can get here. But maybe some of us can get here. See, I, some of us use that as a crutch. I know there's physical limitations. But I was at a funeral just this past Thursday. It was at Episcopalian Church. There was a moment in the service where they said, now everybody kneel. And I watched a choir of 70-some-year-old, 70-year-olds get down on their knees. And in that church, they had kneeling pads in the middle of every pew. I was like, man, that's expectation for your people. That's Balrog. That's what God says to you. He has put a kneeling pad in front of you, and he says, get down. And maybe, maybe you can't even get here, but maybe you can get here or anywhere beside where you've been. Certainly, we can do better than what we've been doing. See, I, there's things about the modern worship movement I like and things I'm not so sure about. I mean, I love that it's laid back, come as you are. Some of the churches, man, we got this coffee house feel, and I love, I love the vibe at that church. And, and but there's, there's parts of it where I'm just like, I, I don't know what to do with this because some people, you know, it's like the coffee house feel, and people come in, they come in with their, you know, you get your coffee and you come in, and it's like. And I'm, I'm just like, do you know where you are? Do you know that you are in the presence of God the Almighty? Do you know that you are in the presence of fiery angels and the redeemed saints of God? How can you just be so casual? How can you just stand there? This ain't no vibe. This is a parade for the king. Get on it. See, this, this moment, what happens in Barak is when you get to this place or you get here, the, the way you get there is, is you become so transfixed on God, His presence, and His glory that the only justifiable position is here. Because I can promise you, if Jesus walked in the room today, you'd be shocked at how quickly you could get underneath that chair because you wouldn't be able to stand His glory. 
Do you know where you are? This is where we become so transfixed with God, His glory, and His presence. And nothing else around us matters. It doesn't matter what people think beside me. It doesn't matter that my body's cranky and old. It doesn't matter whether my coffee's hot or cold, whether the room is hot or cold, or the chairs are soft or hard. It doesn't matter whether the preacher's preaching good or the choir's sounding good. It doesn't matter that I'm not getting fed here. The only thing that matters is all of God. And everything else goes away. That's what he says. Balrog. Maybe you can't get here. But certainly, you can get somewhere different than where you've been. The next word is a word called todal. It means an extension of the hand, thanksgiving, a confession, a sacrifice of praise. I love this one. Thanksgiving for things not yet received, a choir of worshipers. It acknowledges the corporate aspect of worship. All of us together for God's glory. David used this word in Psalm 56, 11 through 12. David the shepherd, the Goliath slayer, King David. He said, and God, I have put my trust and I will not be afraid. Now understand, when David's writing this, he is in captivity. He has been captured by the enemy, the Philistines. He does not know when or where his deliverance is going to come from. He is in a bad way. His circumstances are awful. And yet, he pens these words. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. That phrase there is important. Vows made to you or binding upon me. What he's saying is, God, your word and my vows to you are greater than my experience. So therefore, I choose to bring you thankfulness and praise in spite of my circumstances and whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to bring it anyway because I'm being obedient to you. Oh God, I render praises, todal, to you. David says, even in the midst of my circumstances, even though I don't see deliverance coming, I'm going to thank you for deliverance anyway, even if it ain't here yet. This kind of thankfulness and praise is thankfulness and praise that lifts the atmosphere of the room. This kind of thankfulness and praise is the kind that changes the property value of you and everybody around you. This is when you determine with your praise and your thankfulness to be proactive and not reactive to life circumstances. This is when you say, God, I'm not going to wait to thank you if you get me out of this situation. No, I'm going to thank you through it. That's what I'm going to do. This is when you choose to not be a thermometer and react to the temperature in the room but you choose instead to be a thermostat and set the temperature in the room this is when you thank and praise him in spite of your circumstances you give him thankfulness for things you ain't even got yet even when it doesn't appear like you're going to get them that is toda I want to show you <coughs> some pictures Anybody know where that is? <coughs> Probably not. If you don't, you should. What about this one? Anybody know? Anybody ever been down there? Y'all been y'all been over there for dinner? What about right here? Y'all been on y'all been in that one? Those are places less than five blocks from where you sit right now. Those are the streets that I walk on every month. And I bring the toe down. I bring the thankfulness and I bring the praise. And I walk through those streets and I pray and I proclaim life to dead places over all those dead places back behind us. If you ain't noticed it yet, 
1310 North Cannon Boulevard ain't in the ritzy section of Kannapolis. God put us here for a reason. Now, there's plenty of nice places around here, but there's plenty of dead places. And God put us here for a reason. And every week that we gather together, even though we may not see it, we're giving thanks and we're bringing the toad out for the praise that God is going to bring to this place. Places like even this one. Oh, yeah, y'all know, well, hopefully you don't know that one, but in case you don't, that's the porn shop. There's Bill's car and Doug's car. No, I'm just, I told the first service. I had to do that second service. I repeated that one. I'm just joking. Hopefully those are none of your cars, but if it is, consider the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. But we're bringing the toe down to places like that and even to this one. Oh, yeah, the old beautiful motel. The place of drug trafficking and sex trafficking just up the street where people walk back and forth in the labor and the misery of their addictions in front of our church. All around us, this place is littered with dead places that bring life. Every time we pull in to this parking lot and we celebrate God and celebrate salvation. We are lifting the atmosphere and we are lifting the property value in this area. And I'm telling you, God put 1310 North Cannon Boulevard, He's Alive Church here to lift the property value of the city of Kannapolis, the county of Cabarrus, the state of North Carolina, the country of America, and the planet of the world. And it's going to begin right here because we are going to thank Him even when we can't see it. Even when we don't look, even when all around us are places like that, we're going to proclaim it over this city, and it's going to happen. But the next one is Tehilau. This one means laudation, a hymn, a song of praise, a new song, a spontaneous song. This one is used 57 times in the Scriptures, one of which is Psalm 22, verse 3, but you are holy Enthroned in the praises, Tehilau of Israel. God wants his Tehilau to be among us. Tehilau, new song, spontaneous song. This is a life experience song. These are songs that are birthed out of life experiences. This is when life begins to drive our worship. And for some musicians and songwriters, that's where we get songs that we sing. Some of us, it may be mean singing an old song that we've been singing for a long time in a new way for the first time. Tehilau, because of a life experience. See, this is that moment when you sing It Is Well With My Soul at your mom or your dad's funeral. The first time you sing it after they die. This is when you sing Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus as you're walking in to the doctor's office to get your diagnosis. Life experience is driving your worship. This is when you sing Amazing Grace for the first time when you come up out of your addiction. Life experience is tehilau, driving your worship. See, every single experience in your life matters. There is no amount of suffering or difficulty that does not have meaning. God uses it all, and He intends, nothing is wasted, and He intends to use every one of those for you to bring back to Him in here in worship. That's why it matters that you show up and that you worship. Good gosh, people, if we could just get that. That's the Tehillah. For me, it was December the 22nd, seven years ago, when I walked out of a hospital in Monroe, North Carolina, after just visiting my mom, who was in the hospital <clears throat> fighting for her life and her health. And I did not know in that moment if she was going to come home for Christmas. And I remember getting into my car, and tears started flowing down my face, and I sang, joy to the world 
through that difficult experience. Life experience was driving my worship. That was Tehillah. That is the Tehillah. And I'm going to give you the last two in closing today. One of which is the Hallel. This means to boast, to rave, to shine, to celebrate. And I love this one. To be clamorously foolish. Psalm 20, or excuse me, Psalm 149 verse 3 uses this one. Let them praise Hallel. Let them be clamorously foolish before the Lord. Let them praise His name with dancing and make music to Him with timbrel and harp. This is, it's time to cut loose. This is a celebration. I love that. Be clamorously foolish. Many of you know what it's like to be clamorously foolish. You just need Bud Weiser and Jim Beam to get you there. But the problem is those things were never meant to be the things that got you there. It was salvation that got you there because it was God who gave the church the party first before he gave it to the world. And we were the ones who were supposed to show the rest of the world how to party. That word hallel, that's where we get the word hallelujah. See, the reason so many people like to go off to college and get wild and party and get drunk and do their thing is because nobody in the church ever showed them what a real party was like. The reason people got to go to pimps and drug dealers is because the church never showed the world what a real party looked like. But when you show the rest of the world what a real party looks like, you don't want nothing that the world's got to offer you because you discovered that Jesus is better. And Jesus spoke of that party. It's like a salvation celebration. When people come to faith in Christ or when prodigals return home, we celebrate salvation each and every week. You celebrate your salvation each and every week. And Jesus spoke of it in the parable of the prodigal son, when the prodigal returned home, he spoke of the father's response this way in Luke 15, verses 22 to 24. When the prodigal came back, he said, but his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill that calf we've been fattening up. See, we got to celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead And he has now returned to life. Don't forget our mission is bringing life to dead places. See, that's what we celebrate. And get that last line. He was lost, but now he is found. Oh, and there it is. So the party began. This is where the real party is. God is saying to some of you, it's time to let loose. It's time to party. The party is not out there. The party is right here. But until we start showing the world what a true party is, they're going to keep looking for it out there. See, some of y'all are like Sunday morning solace. Friday night, fire. Saturday night. Hell down. We're going to raise some hell. reason everybody wants to raise hell because the church didn't show them how to raise up heaven. And this is where the party is, people. You can say amen to that. I wonder sometimes if God looks at our worship. And not that so much that he's displeased with us, but I just wonder sometimes if he just looks at our worship and is just totally in the Hallel, just totally bored. You ever wonder if God just looks at the way you worship and is completely just bored with you? Same old seat, same old row, same old thing, same old posture, same old way. Not that He's bored with you in life, but just like 
If he's saying, these are the seven ways I want you to bring it to me. But what you bring is so opposite. I'm just, bleh. Hallel. And the last one, Shabbat. This one is, oh, look out, to address in a loud tone, to shout, to commend glory and triumph. One of the references for this is Psalm 145, verse 4. One generation shall praise Shabbat your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. You get that? One generation shall praise your works to another. In other words, parents, it's your job. I, here's the funny thing. All my life, the only thing my parents showed me was how to keep quiet in church. But that ain't what God said. Now, there's a time to keep quiet. I, I get it. One of the worst whippings my daddy ever said he got was when his dad came out of the choir loft and took him to an actual woodshed. That actually happened. Now, I get all that. But parents, it's actually your job to teach your kid how to shout the praises of Jesus. And some of you, the only thing they get out of you is how to sleep in church. It's your job to teach them. Shout. Now, I get it. God says he speaks in a, a, a small voice. That's 100% true. He says in Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. In the stillness and the silence, he speaks. But that's only half of it. And the other half, he shouts, he raves, he roars like a lion. Where is your shouting, church? Where is your shout of the king? Shabak. See, we always picture him as that small, still voice. But he's so much more. Isaiah 42, he announces the way he wants to enter a room. The Lord will march out like a champion. And like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. Did you notice that? God wants to stir things up. He wants to stir up passion among his people. That's you. And with a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. Many of you, that's your story today. You've been quiet and holding yourself back way too long. But now, many of you need today a but now. But now, and only God, only God can say this. Like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. God says, the way a woman screams in labor without an epidural, that's what I want y'all to do in worship. It's right there. Some of you have lost your shout. And it's time to shout. Because God enters the room like a champion. And if we can shout for the Panthers and shout for all the other things we shout at. Some of you do a real good job at shouting at your husband, shouting at your wife, shouting at your kids. Why don't you shout unto God with a voice of triumph? You come in here and put your church face on and you go out of there and you're like, blah, blah, blah. bring your shout in here to the Lord. If we can bring shouts to people on earth, we can bring a shout to God. Amen.